Alright guys, how's it going? This week, AMD has launched the final Radeon RX series card, the RX 460. Based of course on the Polaris architecture and the Polaris 11 GPU, which is the smaller of the two Polaris GPUs, designed for the very low power entry level market. AMD is touting the RX 460 as the esports gaming champion. There will of course be plenty of benchmarks in this video, even more than usual in fact, but as usual we will start by looking at the card specifications. Right, so the Radeon RX 460, with up to 2.2 teraflops, that is less than half of the RX 470. The reason for which is the compute units of only 14, whereas the RX 470, based on the larger Polaris 10 GPU, had 32 compute units, with the RX 480 having 36. This was a little bit of a surprise because only a couple of months ago, AMD's specifications for the RX 460 showed a GPU with 16 compute units, not 14. This does of course mean that the RX 460 is not the fastest card that AMD could have provided in this entry level desktop segment. The reference card has a 1200 MHz boost clock speed with the base at 1090 MHz. Memory bandwidth of 112GB per second which is of course down to the 128 bit memory bus combined with the effective data rate of 7 gigabits per second. The card comes in memory sizes of 2 or 4 gigabytes of GDDR5 with a typical board power of less than 75 watts. The card that I will be reviewing today is the XFX RX460 with 4 gigabytes of GDDR5 and a 1220 MHz boost clock. So let's take a quick look at the card before moving on to the benchmarks. Right, so here we have a nice picture of the card. It's a really good looking card for the entry level market. Very sporty looking in fact. One of the nice touches about the card is that the fans can be pulled out and replaced. So that could come in handy at a later point. Perhaps slightly gimmicky, but a nice touch all the same. Now looking at the underside, we can see that the PCB is actually quite short and the plastic overhang at the end is due to the larger cooler. It definitely feels like an oversized cooler. For such a small, low power card, you are going to need 24 centimeters off room in your chassis to fit this card in. Now looking at the ports, in this case we do actually have the DVI, which really is a must for the entry level market. And as you can see, we also have DisplayPort and HDMI. The DisplayPort is of course 1.4 HDR ready and the HDMI is 2.0. What none of these images shows is that the card does require a 6 pin connector. Now this was a real surprise to me because I was under the impression that most of these cards would come without 6 pin connectors and I also tried to boot to the card without it but the PC simply would not boot. So you do need a 6 pin connector. Although the card is really low power, it's going to be fine with an adapter. Luckily, there is an adapter included with the package, so really you're just going to need two Molexes, two four pin Molexes, and that will power the card no problem. But that's a card, it looks really nice, and perhaps even over engineered for this market segment, but it looks good. Right, so before we move on to the benchmarks, we'll take a quick look at the benchmarking system. What's relevant here is the graphics cards I will be benchmarking. There is of course the XFX RX460, I'm throwing in my 2GB R9380 and a 2GB ASUS 750Ti. I don't have a GTX 950 which would obviously have been a good comparison card, but not really worth buying simply for this review. So instead of doing that, I'm going to take a quick look at the rest of the technology press, some of whom benchmarked the 950. Otherwise, it's the same as usual with all the drivers up to date. Now regarding temperatures and noise, I never saw the card go above 65 degrees celsius while gaming. However the fan has a very high target speed and gets pretty noisy pretty fast. So if you do buy the XFX RX 460, you're probably going to want to tinker in Walkman with these values. I am pretty sure that you can get the card practically silent and still not go above 75 degrees, which is basically what you want in terms of temperatures and noise. Right, so what you all came for, the benchmarks themselves. I'm actually going to be benching the card on settings which probably aren't suitable for the card. However, later on I'll have a look at a comparative head-to-head -head at medium between the RX 460 and the 750Ti. For now though, in Rise of the Tomb Raider, on very high settings, we can see that there is quite a gap between the R9 380 and the RX 460, with the 460 just over 20% ahead of the 750Ti. Next up is Doom on Ultra. 
with the 750Ti running on OpenGL and both of the Radeons running on Vulkan. And a bit of a surprise, if you remember back to my previous videos, I quite often mentioned that Doom on Ultra may be hitting a hard limit on VRAM amounts, and this would appear to be the proof of it. Because in this game, and in this game only, the RX 460 is actually faster than the R9 380, by the tiniest of margins. Given that in the rest of the benchmarks it is quite some way behind, this does appear to be pointing to a VRAM limit which could be pretty interesting considering the card comes with 2 and 4 gigabytes of VRAM. Basically speaking, what I am saying here is, had this card had 2 gigabytes of VRAM, it could well have been sitting closer to 50 frames per second rather than the 66.4 you see here. But due to the 4 gigabytes of VRAM, it ekes out a very small win. And of course, it is also way ahead of the GTX 750 Ti. Next up, Fallout 4. And once again, we can see a rather large gap between the R9 380 and the RX 460. Fallout 4 is a pretty good game for the Nvidia cards, and the 750 Ti is pretty close here. 45 frames per second on Ultra, not that bad though, given the lowly specs of the card. Now moving on to Hitman, this is a custom setting, because the cards with less VRAM cannot run at the higher texture settings. In this, the RX 460 performs very well indeed, ending up closer than normal to the R9 380, and once again very far ahead of the 750Ti. Hitman is an AMD title, and the Nvidia cards tend to struggle here. Moving on to The Witcher 3, and again we see around a 40% plus gap between the R9 380 and the RX 460. The 750Ti seems to struggle in Witcher 3, even though it's a good game for Nvidia cards. And the final game tested on Ultra settings was Total War Warhammer, where we're looking at a 30% gap between the R9 380 and the RX 460, with the 460 being over 25% ahead of the 750Ti. Interestingly enough, in Total War Warhammer, the RX 460 performed better in DX11 than it did in DX12. There wasn't much in it, maybe 1 frames per second, but it was consistent, and this is not something that I have seen with the other AMD cards. Could be drivers, something else, I'm not quite sure. Overall though, the R9 380 is around 25% faster than the RX 460, with the RX 460 being 42% faster than the GTX 750 Ti. 42% is quite a lot, and it makes you wonder, had AMD sold this card with the full 16 compute units, it would have hit that 50% plus faster overall. That magical 50% number which makes for a good upgrade. But like I said, the RX 460 is more suited to medium settings gameplay. So here is a benchmark of 4 games, Warhammer, Fallout 4, Doom and Tomb Raider, compared against the 750Ti. On medium settings, the RX 460 averaged 55 frames per second over these 4 games, compared to 41.4 frames per second of the 750Ti. And in many cases, you will be looking at the difference between perfectly playable and a little bit suboptimal between these two cards. That's the difference that 33%, which is the gap here in these 4 titles, can mean at medium settings 1080p gaming. Now you might think nobody wants to play on medium, but in actual fact, as time goes by, the image quality differences between settings like medium and ultra become less and less. Here we have Fallout 4 on ultra. And here's the exact same scene on medium. These are the small differences that we see today between medium and ultra settings in many games. I mean sure, it's nice to have the further shadows, the bushes over at the left, and we can see the lights on the lamp posts. It is of course that little bit more atmospheric on Ultra, but the difference in frame rate can be massive. Now my final benchmarks are taken with an overclocked and undervolted card. The maximum overclock I reached was 1340 MHz on the core and 1800 on the memory. That required 1150 millivolts, which is the maximum that Wattman will allow. So if you want to push it further, you're going to have to overclock with a different program. The magenta bar at the bottom shows the difference of the red stock values. It really depends on the game, but overall you can expect to see a few extra percent over the stock 1220 megahertz speeds. What I found much more interesting however, I also underclocked the card to 1020 megahertz, while at the same time undervolting 
to 800 millivolts, which again is the lowest that Wattman will allow. The reason for this was to test against the 750Ti at the card's most power efficient. As you can see here, even at 1020 MHz, the RX 460 is still ahead of the GTX 750Ti in all games and of course very far ahead in Doom. Now the reason for all this was to check the power consumption of course, and this is ultra settings power draw at the wall. As you might expect, when you overclock the card, again that's the magenta bars, the power consumption can really increase, especially in a game like Doom. That's 186 watts at the wall, on ultra, on Doom, with the overclock. This could be related to asynchronous compute, as looking elsewhere it's nowhere near as high. What is interesting is that in the next generation DX12 and Vulcan titles, the power draw is higher, and I believe one of the reasons for this is that the CPUs are being used much more. Games are much better threaded. If you look at the single threaded games like Fallout 4 and Tomb Raider, we can see that the wattages are much lower. The really interesting thing here is that at 1020 MHz, the orange bar, the RX 460 becomes incredibly energy efficient. Even though we saw before that at 1020 MHz, the RX 460 was still faster than the 750Ti, it now consumes an awful lot less energy. Look at some of the gaps between 1220 MHz, the red bar, and 1020 MHz undervolted to 800mV of the orange bar. Over 50 watts in the case of Tomb Raider, which is absolutely massive in a card with a board power of around 75 watts. Some of these numbers are very good indeed, and it gives away the true nature of the Polaris series especially Polaris 11, which is effectively a laptop GPU on the desktop. But really, this is all about pointing out what you can expect from the RX 460 in a laptop. And the card will also be called the RX 460 in mobile. And AMD has gone to unprecedented lengths to point this out. We can see here that the difference between an RX 460 on the desktop with a 6700K compared to an RX 460 notebook with an i5 6300HQ we're looking at a gap of around 10% performance, which probably comes at less than half the power draw. And here again, we can see some numbers, mobile versus desktop performance, which in most cases, you're looking 10%. Now these are AMD's own numbers on eSports performance, but you can quite clearly see that if you're playing any of these games, and many of you are, the RX 460 is more than enough for all of these games on very good settings. Now the last thing to look at, over at Hexus, they did indeed compare their own RX 460 Nitro to the ASUS GTX 950 overclocked. And over the piece, the 460 Nitro won more than it lost. As you might expect, it tends to do better in AMD titles and not quite so well in the Gameworks games. Overall, it came in around 8 or 9% faster. Over at Hexus, they found it consumed that little bit less power than the 950. What this simply means is, there were only two viable choices in this bracket. You had the 750Ti, or you had the GTX 950. On the AMD side, you had the R7260X, which could beat the 750Ti using a little bit more power. Now we've got the RX 460, which is capable of beating the 950 using a little bit less power. So for the first time in a very long time, AMD is now squarely in the lead in this low-end bracket, at least in terms of performance and performance per watt. This is a position they haven't held since the 750Ti launched over three years ago. So what's the catch? Well, the catch is the amount of money that this costs. In this particular instance, the XFX RX460 with 4GB of GDDR5 memory costs $139. And the Sapphire Nitro 4GB GDDR5 also costs $139, as does the Asus Strix with 4GB. And in fact, only the power color Red Dragon with 4GB of GDDR5 costs less at $129. $139, even $129, that is a little bit close to the $179 of the RX 470 which is a much, much faster graphics card. Now here's the thing, a graphics card has a minimum bill of materials and everybody involved in the supply chain needs to get paid. AMD needs to get paid, Global Foundries who manufacture the GPUs, they need to get paid, AMD's partners need to get paid, all the way down to the shop that sells you the card, they all want their cut. And these entry level graphics cards 
are not good value because of this. But in this particular case, it seems to be the amount of VRAM which has pushed the cost up to $140 because you can pick up an XFX RX460 2GB GDDR5 for $109. Basically the same card with half the VRAM. But this puts me in a little bit of a quandary because we've already seen what the VRAM can do in a game like Doom. And this is the thing, these entry level low end cards, especially the AMD ones, are basically being pushed up a tier in performance in games like Doom and it's quite possible that we will see this in future Vulcan titles too. So is it worth going for the 4GB over the 2? For me, at $30 more, not in a card like this. So if you are going to buy one of these cards, even though in future the 4GB of VRAM could make a difference, it is still nowhere near worth $139. Instead of paying that for the 4GB card, find the money somehow, get to $179 and get the RX 470 instead. So $109 is a fair price for this graphics card. Especially if you play these esports games, Overwatch, Counter-Strike, Rocket League. This card is more than enough for all of those games and is a new standard for the entry level. There is no point in buying a 750 Ti. There is no point in buying a GTX 950. They will simply fall further behind the RX 460 over the next couple of years. It's disappointing that AMD decided to cut down this GPU rather than giving us the full 16 compute unit graphics card which would really have made that $139 price a lot more palatable. But as it is, we don't even know if Nvidia will release anything in this segment for a very long time yet. And effectively, the only worthwhile choice right now is the RX 460. Just don't overpay on the 4GB version. Right, I hope you enjoyed this review. We have some Zen information at the end of the month, but before then, a rather big head-to-head -head between the RX 480 and the GTX 1060. I'll catch you later, guys.